it's a great privilege uh, as the BBC's medical editor, but also a very proud Biobank participant uh, to chair this session. Um, I, I well remember going for my uh, baseline assessment in Birmingham, would have been, I think, 11 years ago. I, I was one of the last of the 500,000 men and women aged 40 to 69 who signed up for this. Uh, and there was a great sense of pride. The, the, the nearest thing I can think to it is it was a little bit like the atmosphere um, when people were coming along for their first uh, COVID vaccine. There was a very um, a great sense of participation, a great sense of, uh, uh, of enjoyment and uh, people feeling that they weren't necessarily doing something for their health, but for the health of their children and for future generations. So we've now got to the point today where I think 200,000 of the 500,000 people, their whole genome sequences, uh, that data has been handed over to researchers. Um, and I always like to think of, of UK Biobank a little bit like a fine wine, that uh, the, the older it gets and the older all of us get, the more data uh, that comes out. But, but uh, uh, enough from me, um, as you can see on the screen, um, there are three uh, people I'm going to be talking to um, for the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, Sir Jeremy Farrer, Director of the Wellcome Trust, Professor Rory Collins, the Principal Investigator of UK Biobank, and Professor Fiona Watt, uh, the Executive Chair of the MRC. Um, let, me, let me start with you, uh, Jeremy. Um, it, it, it's very much the sense of democratising access to research. Um, how important is that, and how important was that for the Wellcome Trust both now and looking forward, this democratic access to, to this really rich database. I hope you can hear me, Fergus. I can hear you very well, but I yes. hope you can hear me. Hear you fine. Um, uh, I, I really like the way you describe it as a fine wine, and, and, and we shouldn't forget that because the benefits come over time. I think you, you, it's a very nice way of describing it. And I'm, a, I'm only sorry that I can't join you in claiming to be a participant in in Biobank because I, I wasn't actually living in the country when the recruitment of my cohort age went through. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, you can, uh, I don't know this is true with fine wine, but you can get you, you can get so used to things. Things can be so part of your sort of culture, life, science, whatever it is, that you take it for granted. We, we really must continue to celebrate Biobank because um, it's changed everything. In a way, and, and I know that's a melodramatic, a big thing to say, but it, it, it's it's it, the involvement, the pride that people who take part in it, the commitment they make, the the commitment of everybody involved. And Rory deserves great credit. This and the whole team that he works with of opening up this data to everybody, the democratization, as you rightly say, uh, and the diversification, yes, of funding, but also of the scientific approaches and the questions that are asked. I mean. It's, I could go on for hours, but I won't because the others will want to say something. But I just think you really have to pause at points and celebrate what you've got and appreciate. It's changed the whole nature of the way we do things. And how important is this in a global context in terms of, sort of the UK presence in, in the life sciences and health environment? I mean, how important a piece of that jigsaw is, is the UK Biobank cohort and the, and the, the data it provides? I can't, I can't. Sorry, I feel like the biggest cheerleader of buyback, but 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 you can't overestimate that. And as you know, Fergus, very well. I, I, on a personal level and professional one, I, I I think the internationalization of science and the sharing of information across borders is actually the only way we're going to we're going to um, cope with the 21st century. And buyback was there before many many others were, including opening its data to the world, not not just to somebody sitting in London or Oxford or Edinburgh or Manchester, but to the world. And, and I'd be, I don't know the figures off the top of my head for the number of researchers around the world that engage on a daily or monthly or yearly basis in Biobank, but it's massive. And I think one of the great tributes in science is when everybody else comes to learn from you and when people copy what you're doing and may make it better. Um, that adds a little bit of degree of competition. Um, and I think it's fair to say that whether you look in the United States, you look in China, you look in the European Union, you look increasingly in Africa, uh, people look at Biobank and say, what did they do? How were they successful? How were the funders supporting of it? And the MRC here deserves great credit. Fiona's talk later, but MRC deserves great credit. Uh, what can we learn from the way they did it? How can, might we do it better? 
and that also encourages Biobank to think how it should evolve as well. But but Biobank was there at the first and deserves enormous credit for it uh, in changing, as I say, the way we approach science. Um, and well, let me bring you in, Fiona. Um, uh, obviously, the MRC and and Wellcome were the uh, initial key funders here uh, and supporters of it now. Um, for you, has it has it lived up to the vision, or or, or hopefully exceeded it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the vision um, that was laid out at the outset um, has has remained unchanged. So to improve prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of a whole range of diseases, which uh, will um, tend to manifest in uh, the second half of life. So I think. The, the fact that it's achieved it is a source of pride. Um, I would um, emphasize that this is a partnership with all the volunteers, including yourself, Fergus, without these half million people who've stuck the course, um, Biobank would have failed. But what has, what I don't think anyone could have anticipated is just how, um, quickly the technology would advance so that the sequencing is much cheaper than it was. The integration, so different kinds of data, you know, imaging uh, different organs and now relating that to genetics. Um, I also, going back to Jeremy's point, was I don't think we would have anticipated uh, how important it's been in a diplomatic sense in leading the way internationally in open sharing of data. And now, of course, seeing uh, different kinds of funders coming together to um, push forward the next stage of the project. So, so those things were surprising, but I think to the original mission is, uh, is unchanged. It, it's just remarkable how it's delivered on that. And, and what about the future? What, what, are, what are your hopes there? Because you know, we, we've likened it to a fine wine. Is, is it just gonna get better and better? Yes, it's in, in honour of this event, I, I pulled out a, a, an internal MRC slide. Um, and, you know, we, we, we're charged with spending taxpayers' money wisely. So this graph shows um, input of £65 million around 2005 or six. In terms of output publications, nothing. Uh, then £96 million, not obvious. And now, um, you know, as, as we've continued to invest, the output is just massive. Um, so I think that it will only accelerate in terms of the insights that it provides into uh, all different aspects of disease. And um, this, as, as we integrate different types of approaches, it's going to be great. And of course, as Jeremy said, others are wanting to um, emulate what we've done. There's a, a new um, project underway called Our Future Health, which um, could be UK Biobank times 10. Um, and if we can encourage the whole population of the UK to of the benefits of altruistically sharing data to benefit other people, I think that's very much consistent with our attitude to the National Health Service. Yeah, well, before I go on to, to Rory, I just quickly wanted to ask there, I mean, because it has been this altruistic um, approach and the sort of problems we've seen with um, uh, the idea of data collection and um, uh, integrated medical records uh, that and big data, um, supposed big data, we haven't seen that with UK Biobank. And I just wonder what lessons there are generally for um, data collection and the sort of um, uh, messaging we, we need to give to the public. Well, uh, Rory can say much more about this than I can, but it has to be about being open and honest about what we are trying to do. Um, it's not it's not acceptable to say, well, I'm a scientist or a doctor, trust me. You need to say, I understand um, that different citizens will have different concerns. Th this is what we want to do and this is uh, why. And honestly, when we don't know what the future holds, we should just say that. Um, but I think that um, the, the biobank communications um, are, are really good. And it's all about explaining clearly what, what, what biobank is up to. Yeah, um, well, 
uh, Rory, um, you've been involved from from the start, and interesting. Uh, I've got the figures here. In by 2016, there'd been 100 peer-reviewed papers using UK Biobank data. Um, since 2016, there've been over 2,300. So it speaks for itself. It is a it is a sort of exponential growth, which normally we associate with things like COVID, but th this is in a in a good way. Um, <clears throat> for you. Um, you know, what, what do you think have been the greatest achievements so far? I, th I think that the altruism of the participants is, is quite clear, I mean, um, and it's mentioned. But, but I, I think from being involved closely in UK Biobank, the thing that perhaps doesn't get mentioned enough is the altruism of the scientific community. Um, I mean, our job within UK Biobank is essentially as a kind of coordinator. Uh, but there has been enormous uh, contributions from scientists across the UK and internationally in helping to design and, and guide us in how to build UK Biobank and, and uh, I was going to say build it better, um, uh, you know, to, to make it more useful for, for research. So, you know, the genetic working group that has called on uh, expertise across the world, the, the imaging working group that has worked out how to image um, tens of thousands of people way beyond what had ever been done before. Uh, there's so much uh, engagement by the research community, not just in using UK Biobank, but in building it. And, and I think that's been a transformation also. It, you're going back to Jeremy's point about team science. Um, the team, the, the international team is building UK Biobank is working at how to make it better and is using it in ways that are, are really remarkably imaginative. Sometimes it's just fun to kind of see how people have used the data in ways that one just would not have anticipated to make discoveries um, uh, that uh, I think no single research group would come up with. I, I wonder why um, you've taken the decision not to... Oh, we have music again. Right. Um, sorry. I wonder Thank why you, um, you, you <laughs> decided not to not to charge industry a premium for, for access. And, and I, I, what was the what was the decision there? Well, it was really goes back to the original vision of the MRC and the Wellcome Trust, which was to make sure that the participants provided data that was then used for the widest range of important research and. There are fantastic researchers in academia, but there are also fantastic researchers in industry. Um, and uh, we wanted to ensure that uh, the data were used as effectively. Um, the industry have actually helped, particularly going back to my earlier point, to make the data uh, even more valuable. So to, to Fiona's point about in, um, the investment of the MRC and the Wellcome Trust, and of course, UKRI, um, Cancer Research UK, uh, the NIHR, BHF, in building the core, has then generated something like 12 to 1 leverage of external funding, largely from industry, to fund assays of the samples uh, to make the data even more valuable for uh, every researcher who uses the resource. And today, of course, we're uh, releasing the sequence data for the first 200,000 uh, participants uh, funded by both public and private um, funding, MRC, Wellcome Trust, uh, and industry. Now, I, I think I've if stood you treat in the... people well, then they'll treat you well. Yeah. I, I've stood in the freezers in, in Stockport. I think they, they might be Europe's largest commercial freezers, where all of our blood and saliva is, is, is stored. I mean, they were kind of set up more than like 20 years ago. Have you, have you got, is the storage of things changed in the last 20 years or have, is everything uh, cryo frozen as you would want it? Or do you, need to, do you need us to pop back to give another sample? Well, I would love to get everybody back uh, and get more samples from them because of course your genes don't change, but the other measures in you do. And um, I think as we move over the next five and 10 years, it will be looking at proteomic, metabolomic, and other kinds of assays to identify the links between 
the genetic target uh, and disease. Uh, so I think those assays would be, be valuable. But I, I th the thing that we're seeing is actually the robots can't keep up with the level of demand and the level of investment to, to turn the samples into data. And I think that's uh, the scale of that, as Fiona mentioned, um, and the speed of being able to assay the whole cohort has really been much greater than we anticipated. And, and is anyone learning from the lesson from UK Biobank? In, is any other country or organization now doing anything on even remotely similar scale? Well, the US is spending something like $400 million a year to establish the r Future Health Study. Um, and they have recruited, I think, about 300,000 people into a target uh, million people. Uh, it has a very different population, I think a lot of uh, Hispanic. Um, so I think that would be a very valuable contribution. Um, and Fiona mentioned the, uh, the uh, Our Future Health Study. Uh, we've, we have, as Jeremy said, shared what we've learned and we learn back from them things that we could do better. Okay, thank you. So, so just looking to the future then, um, Fiona, what, what for you, what for the MRC is, is the priority now? Is, is it, is it in, a, in a sense you kind of let the researchers um, use the data and sort of drive where this goes? Or are, are there particular areas you'd like Biobank to look at? I don't think that um, as funders we would um, specify what Biobank should look at. Um, I think what we um, want to, we want to make sure that it keeps growing um, at this remarkable rate um, and that we are able to make the right kind of partnerships with with other funders to to keep it sustainable because this leverage that Rory described is impressive but it also brings challenges you know big lumps of investment for specific things when the core is actually quite lean so we want to make sure that um, we support um, Biobank and um, help help make sure that as it expands and diversifies we're not uh, we're, we're protecting that and Jeremy, I, I just wondered whether Welcome um, ha, has is supporting anything I, I, in Africa or Southeast Asia to to do something similar with a very different uh, populations there that might twenty years from now, ten years from now, yield something similar for for people maybe in low and middle income countries. Yeah, it's a really important point. And, and, you know, again, I pay tribute to the Biobank team because they've been incredibly generous with their time about advising others, including the US, but as you rightly say, in, in South Asia and, and uh, indeed China and and, uh, and Africa. And it is critical because if there were, interesting Roy comment on this, but if there was one, I suppose, criticism of the Biobank in the UK, it, it is, it's not necessarily representative of the whole UK population. We know that and, and you know, not everything is perfect, but by, but by, by encouraging the same openness between Biobank, the US, Africa, South Asia, China, wherever it is, you know, that is the future. And that will bring also diversity of populations, diversity of environmental exposures, and of course, inevitably also uh, genetics. But if I could just make one other point, which is to funders, if there are any funders on the call, um, and that is this point of long-term investment is so important. And you've got to be patient because in the first few years, you don't get much back. And you've just got to be sure at the start, as my predecessors at Wellcome and Fiona's predecessor at MRC were committed for the long term. Because if you push it too hard at the start, you push short term scientific answers, and they're not really where the power of Biobank and the long term cohorts are. So invest for the long term, give it the confidence of that long term, and don't expect much back in the first few years, but put in place that fine wine that you talk about. Great. Well, that's a good point to, to end on. I'm afraid our times come up. Um, but Rory, Jeremy, Fiona, thank you. Thank you all very much. And I look forward to the next email asking me to be imaged or give blood or saliva or go and get on a treadmill. I'm, I'm up for it. So thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
As always, when you have a, not me, but when other people have a, a brilliant idea, there's a lot of people say, oh, you could never do it. You could never persuade people. You could never persuade the, the science community to work together in that way. Twenty years on, I think it's delivering more than anybody could possibly have imagined. And it's really only just getting started. There's one key feature to the type of science we do, and that is sample size, sample size, sample size. I could go on at length about the number of different ways we have used UK Biobank. We have used the data to massively improve our sample size for a whole bunch of different diseases that we're studying. We're making these data available to researchers all around the world. We're kind of leveraging the imagination of the world's researchers, taking these data and looking at them in different ways and coming up with really quite unexpected uh, findings. The ability to link some of the information on people in Biobank with genomic information is of huge value in trying to understand causal pathways in diseases which might be amenable to treatments. And so, great starting point for drug discovery. You can just see all the time a study will be published with some interesting finding. If they refer to a large population, you can pretty much bet your money it's UK Biobank. Over the next five or ten years, as the cohort ages, as more health outcomes are identified in the cohort, that will enable even more um, valuable research to be performed. So I do think Biobank has been one of those types of collaborations that has led the way for how you can work across public and private, across government funded and private funded, across large and small, and across borders. This, this feeling of partnership is so important. The value of sharing data has never more clearly been shown than in UK Biobank. Honestly, I think the UK Biobank is the single most impactful data set that has ever been examined in the history of genetics research. So it's huge thank you to those volunteers. They are fantastic. It's their DNA, it's their health records. They're the mystery with all the clues that we're trying to solve. Things are possible now that were never possible before. And that's what makes it such an exciting resource. My guess is you'll sit here in the turn of the next century and people will still be talking waxing lyrically about Biobank.